Hey everyone, you're here with Mark on Perfect Garden CV. So we're in gardening season 2023. And one of the things to always look out for, like I, I would say year after year, this is way of guiding metrics and pulling in information is you really want to pay attention to certain types of information and, and visualize it or, or be able to digest it year after year. And the issue with most retail stores or businesses, especially in this industry is they don't exist in the following year or the retail store, they're pushing the newest, hottest thing on the market. Here at Perfect Gardens, we don't do that. We like to, once we find something we like and that's in line with our values, we continue to keep building upon the story and bringing more information and more metrics so that you can feel comfortable and confident as you go and make a decision. One of the things we'll be talking about today is Organic Shield. We talked about it a lot in 2022. And then this year, we're going to be bringing out case studies. And in this one, we'll be inviting Holt back onto the show to go over a simple PowerPoint that's going to break down in a simpler understanding of what is Organic Shield. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. We got our $2.99 membership and we have a VIP if you need a little more one-on-one -on -one, link down in the description. Holt, please um, let's go ahead and share the screen and introduce sure. yourself if you no one's sure. ever seen you. Sure, absolutely. Everyone, my name is Holt Crowder. I um, work for a company called Organic Shield, and um, Mark absolutely loves this product, so we really appreciate you guys having us back on the show. And we've had a lot of success, and actually we're starting to see more and more as the word gets out. Uh, we're having people call left and right and make and place orders, and I'm actually doing the follow-up to call. How did you find out about us? Because I'm always shocked to find how this gets shared, but we're very excited um, that we can have an impact. A couple of ways we look at things is we are a, a, a very safe product in that we are a actually a copy of something that plants make. Sucrose octanoid is the actual molecule, but this is produced by very few plants and we basically figured out how to synthesize it so that we could share it with you and that it can it basically can get rid of all your chemical challenges when it comes to insect control in your garden so basically we're just excited to, to be back on mark's show again so let's go through this mark the if you want to flip the first pest i'm sure they've sure. already seen this so if you want to flip through that all right so essentially that's what we were going down this path of as that um our kind of goal with this substance and this product is if we can give you or give the consumer the same outcome that they might get from a chemical or an oil or something else. We're always, I say always, let's say 99% of the time to, to hedge myself, but we're 97% of the time going to have a better safety profile, regardless of the concentration of the use. And what that means is if you get this product on your hands, if the product gets in the water supply, on the dirt, um, on your dog's food, or your cat licks it or whatever, it's not going to kill. It's not a poison. It does not poison. It is closer related to maybe a safe soap or not a safer soap, but like a just detergent or something that is organically derived. So that's a little bit more what we're trying to do is, is hopefully take all these negative chemicals and, and bad things out of the environment and replace them with something that uh, one, handles your bugs and two, uh, helps the plant grow. So essentially the basic constituents that we make this with are certain components that are taken out from coconut oil. It's not like you can take coconut oil and sugar and make it yourself. There is a multi-phasic vacuum distillation that this uh, that has this goes through. It takes quite a while and there's been a lot of science and research and patenting behind it. What we're all looking for is the outcome is a safe molecule. It's a molecule again, like I said, sucrose octanoate that does exist in nature. A few plants do make it and we really had to figure out how to synthesize it because some people said, why don't you just grow these plants and harvest it. The, it you couldn't do it in a commercial capacity. Uh, so sometimes you have to synthesize things and make an exact copy of a molecule to bring it out to, to be safe for use. But that's essentially what it's made for. So it made from, so it's it's made from the constituents of plants. And it's a copy of what other plants use for bug defense. We just, like I said, we synthesized it so we could uh, bring it to you. Unless, and Mark, if you have questions, I'm going yeah, to- Yeah, well, the, you know, the, this is, this one slide actually really, when it popped out to me when I was going through it, I was like, man, we got to create a video on this. Was this, once again, you're deriving this from something that people would digest on a daily basis. I mm -hmm. mean, coconut at water your this is the deriv uh, the derivative of what your substance is coming from and i found that to be incredibly reassuring because it's not like you're taking table sugar right it's not like mm -hmm. you're getting regular old sugar that you get in the packet so when you go over to denny's it's not this cheap table sugar but you're actually even finding you're deriving it from a high quality plant and i, I was just i was just like wow that's that was another yeah, layer of depth yeah, you're actually definitely right it's i mean i guess a better way to say i'm, I'm trying to formulate this so for for whenever you post all this out is that basically we copied nature and then so we could bring it to you. It's nature's natural defense. I had this written down somewhere that I forgot what it, how I said it, but it sounded really good. But it was something along the lines of, this is created, invented by nature, copied by us to share with you. I like that. You like that? Yeah, so yeah. so this, so folks, when you look at this, you know, obviously we take the components out of coconut and sugar to do this, but it's a refining process. But essentially what we've done is this was invented by nature, copied by us to share with you. How's that? Yeah, I love it. And okay. this is where it comes down in this. Uh, and like you're saying, it is refined. It's not just taken there, it's refined into your plant esters. Yes, essentially, that's the process. And that's the magic and the patenting and and even the, the the challenge of making this because like I've said before, the plants that make this, they secrete it on their hair, their trichomes or their hairs as a natural bug defense. But you just couldn't it just monetarily would not make any sense. You just wouldn't be able to grow enough and try to extract it. So having to figure a way to synthesize it, that was where the magic and things uh, happen. And just like on this slide, there's a huge refining process. And even though 
even though it's raw refined in the process, there is no downstream harm in nature to nature. There's nothing going in the drain that goes bad. Uh, there are some solvents we use that are organic natural solvents. They're food grade, but the great thing about those is um, as part of the process, we're able to re to purge those out, recapture and use for the next batch and the next batch. So um, there, are no, there are really no losers in this. We're copying nature, bringing it to you. And uh, the only real loser, I guess, would be the bugs because even after the bug dies and they dry out, if this gets in your water supply, like I said, or your dog's food, your cat food or in your food or whatever, it's, it's not a poison. And the bugs will never be able to build a tolerance to it because it physically attacks them. It does not uh, circulate in the plant. So if you sprayed your plant or you, you sprayed your apple, even you could eat your apple or you could wash off your apple and eat your apple. Either way, it's not going to hurt you. And it's not the, the the product actually doesn't go into the plant. It stays on the outside of the surface where the bugs attack and gives you that shield. That's the name Organic Shield. Most of our competitive products or products that are in the same space. They tend to go inside the plant. And they also tend to leave residue or if they have oils, they're going to clog the stoma and the plant can't breathe. We're aqueous. The plant can breathe. And actually, we actually break down into one of the components is CO2. And if you consider that if you got injured or hurt and you went to the hospital, they might give you an oxygen mask or an oxygen tent. And if you were a plant, they might give you a CO2 mask or a CO tent. tent. So use Organic Shield has more benefits and we'll be doing more studies to bring this out to show it, but it has more benefits than just controlling your bugs. But that's what we're marketing for is controlling your bugs. But you don't be surprised if you use this and you go, wow, it did kill my bugs, but I also happen to see some growth and this and that. It's it's interesting the things we're still learning that this valuable substance that nature invented, we're going to figure a lot more things to do with it. But for now, let's take care of the bugs and get the bad chemicals out. Go ahead in the next slide. Yeah. Some of the sweeteners in the industry as well, mm -hmm. they use cane sugar, you know, when it, which I find when I just listen to you and watch this, it, this is also, this pesticide fungicide is a replacement for even some of the other sweeteners on the market. And it, when you look at it, like how they well, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't product, put it in your I wouldn't put it in your coffee now, Mark. What do you mean sweetener? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually thought about it a few times. Because like, it doesn't taste sweet. It's an es it's an ester though. So it's not going to taste sweet. It's It's been fractured. Um, So it's it's very safe though. Uh, so, oh yeah, it works like, okay. So so essentially this slide tells about how it works to desiccate a bug. And essentially this is this is basically like it works. The reason we say soap in this is because sa people understand that safe is uh, soap is safe things. You know, ivory soap is fairly safe. It just like soap when you're washing your hair or shampoo, or whatever, you don't want to get it in your eyes. Uh, it won't do any, it won't do any permanent damage. It'll just burn like soap in your eyes. But essentially the, the modality of how this functions is once you spray it, you want to make contact with the bug. And unlike some other things, a lot of things that people spray are chemicals or something that hangs around in the environment and leaves a poison behind. We're not, we don't poison things. We physically, um, or the substance physically attacks the bug, breaks down the waxy cuticle of the bug. All, all these bad bugs out there that people don't realize have these little waxy cuticles. Even the beetles have to some extent waxy cuticles around them. What we do is it washes that away. It emulsifies that waxy cuticle and then the bug dries out. Also, it leaves open for microbes to attack it, but the bug basically dries out um, and dies in a rapid succession. Okay, great. This next slide, obviously, you know, we have a little bee on here and best of all, this doesn't hurt people, plants or the planet. And in fact, it's a proof of varroa mite. So let me give you a little story about that. And, and this is true. The product is plant safe, people safe, planet safe, pet safe. You know, it's, it has just one of the best safety profiles of any insecticide out there. Now we do have a bee label applic or application for honeybee to kill the varroa mite. There's a gentleman, I, I would share his name, but I don't have his permission, but he was in Georgia and he went to a store where one of our distributors having, was having a sort of a distributor day. And, and uh, he's not even a cannabis grower. He's a, He's a, he owns apiary. He's a bee guy. And so he got some, and he and I talked about this and he did a study where he sprayed and he's still in the process, but he sprayed hundred bees and hundred bees survived. So, or didn't hurt any of the bees at all. And his next test is going to do the varroa mite test. But first, you know, the same way I, I like to approach this is when we did this product was first do no harm. And then two, can you help? And so our product does no harm and it can only do help. What he is doing with this now is he has some chickens and he asked me there's mites on his chickens. Will this work on those? And I said, absolutely. It's skin safe on animals. So he took a little, um, those little kitty pools and put water in it and put a dilute, you know, put the organic shield product and diluted it in there, took the chickens and basically gave them a little bath uh, so that the mites would make contact with uh, the organic shield solution. And then I said, you know, you could take that water afterwards and you could filter it all out, the, the bug, you know, all the poop or the chicken feathers or whatever, and then spray that because it's not going to go to waste. So he did just that. And now he's told me that one, it took care of the mites and the chickens like a champ. And two, he said, you know, we spray it everywhere, anywhere there's animals because, you know, barnyards are full of muck and poop and, and bugs and soft body bugs, especially, which we were, we were great with soft body bugs and mites. So he said the farm has looked, never looked better around the barnyard because people even who've known me for years are like, what did you do, man? There's no bugs anymore. This is great. So there, there's other applications that we'll be bringing out uh, for you, but it's, it's, it has a, it has such a high safety profile. And I guess part of the reasons we put this uh, one slide on here is, is bees are, you know, everybody uh, knows about, we got to save the bees or we're all going to die. And this, so this is a bee safe product. As a matter of fact, there's an application that helps the bees. It's a little bit lower dose than what we plant, spray on a plant, but it's just because uh, just to, to make sure we take care of the bees. So let's go to the next one, unless you have a question, Mark. Yeah, absolutely.
absolutely. It just pointing this out there for any large scale industrial farms. We don't really feel this cost when we are a small farm, but for large industrial costs, there's a there's actually a budget in there for protective equipment. So, yeah. you know, when you don't have to worry about controlling every aspect and making sure something doesn't get on another thing. And if it does, you lose it or you now poison something or it poisons something down the line. All these things actually end up adding cost or mm -hmm. they end up reducing the cost uh, because uh, of efficiencies. Very true. And, I've even yeah. seen some things in, in monocrop and broad acre type things where they were required, the farmers, you know, would suit up and they may spray whatever poisons to kill whatever bug or herbicides or whatever it was. However, even after they sprayed it, they had to sequester, which means just to lock up all their cows and animals, because if the animals or whatever, or, you know, licked the, the leaves or got into it for about two days or three days, I think it would kill them because mm -hmm. that was that dangerous of pesticides. Exactly. So yeah, you never have to worry about that with us. And that's, that's something we're definitely proud of is our safety profile is second to none. Actually, we are listed on the code of federal regulations. If anybody actually wants to look that deep, uh, the code of federal regulations under sucrose octanoate is tolerance exempt in and all food commodities. Now the product doesn't stay in the environment that long after you spray it, it's around for maybe five days. It, it breaks down and, you know, gives the plant some, some benefits of, of a little bit of carbohydrates and CO2 and things, but it's just so safe that it's not going to, you know, you never have to worry about it causing any of those problems. Like some of these other things that they're using nowadays. I'm sorry. I kind of lost my brain on that one. No, I love it. I love um, it. So I mean, okay. So, so actually we were just talking about this. So on this slide, a lot of things have disadvantages and that's exactly what we were just speaking on the last slide is um, we don't leave residues behind. We break down to components that either the plant can absorb or the, the microbes in the dirt or something like that, or in, something in the environment will uptake. There's no waste um, of our product. Now, if you have an oil and not for all the guys who sell oil, sorry if I'm picking on you, but I'm going to pick on you. The oils, will, the whole job of the oil is just to coat and try to suffocate a bug. And so people will spray another oil and they'll spray another oil and they're called spray and pray, hoping that they've got the bug. But the other downside people forget is two things with any type of oil product is one, they're going to clog your stomas. And the stomas are the little gas exchange underneath the leaves that bug, that, sorry, that plants use to breathe. And they, they basically breathe out oxygen and they inhale CO2, one of the components we break down into. So that's one of the things. And then the other things with the oils, if you're an indoor grower or if you're growing vegetables under grow lights and things like that, then it will cause um, damage to your plant because it can burn the plant. With organic shield, you don't have to turn your lights on after you sprayed it. It's not going to clog your stoma. Um, so the plant can still breathe, kill the bugs and keep growing. And then we always, not always, but I'll just, the people who share it with us, it's, it's always, it never surprises me now. They're always like, hey, hold, this was great. It got rid of my bugs. Oh yeah, I had some PM. Did you, you didn't tell me it killed PM, but my PM's gone now. And my plant took off growing faster than ever. I don't know what, what is this stuff? And that's kind of a common thing we have. We're doing some tests as a, as a fungicide type product. So we may be able to add that to label. We have to have the, obviously the EPA, which makes us different than any, a lot of the other products is we are actually EPA registered. And to people who are laymen or don't really quite get what that means because they might be using a product that's oil-based, but it's not EPA registered. It may be EPA exempt, but it's not registered. And what basically what registered mean is we had to prove to scientists and show the studies. And then the EPA scientists had to review and they had to sign that they didn't have to, they could have not signed off on it, but they saw the value and they saw that it worked and the efficacy and they signed off on it. Now, if you have a product that is not EPA registered, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that the EPA did not validate their claims. That's all it means. And the reason some of these guys with FIFRA 25B exemptions do that, if you look up FIFRA 25B, you'll realize it's is if they have, uh, it's a list of basically things that are basically considered to be organic. And if you have one or more of those ingredients in your product, you can go straight to market. And that sounds good. And then the game becomes a marketing game of which oil has the best marketing game, I guess, and makes those claims. But uh, we kind of went a different path and went registered. So if you see a product and it's not, doesn't have an EPA number, then you'll kind of know that it doesn't mean it doesn't work. I don't want to poo-poo that. I just want to be honest that it means they did not be, their claims were not validated by the government or the EPA. PA oversight. Another little thing about us is we are ORMI. I know that's a big uh, catch term now is to be ORMI, which means Organic Research Materials Institute. What most people do not realize though, the organic, that, that particular company is great. They do their thing. They put it out there, but they are a for-profit or a quasi-for-profit company. So you can take that how you want. One thing that we have that a lot of companies don't have, or a lot of uh, competitors in the space, uh, the insecticide space don't have, is we are approved by the National Organic Standards Board, which is a governmental agency. And we are on the NOP, the National Organic Product List, our substances. That's the, really the only, the active ingredient in our product is is sucrose octanoate, and that is on the National Organic Product List. As a, if you're a certified organic farm, that means you can only use things from that product list. If you're a certified organic farm, you may not be able to use an ORM product. Not all our ORM products are on the NOP, and that's why I think it's a little bit more stringent, a little bit higher level of certification. If you are an organic farm, you basically you have to abide by that, or you can lose your organic status. So ORMI is great for you know consumer likes it and they get to see this, but just always like to share the the, the knowledge of that um, that ORMI is good, but it's I think NOP is better. That's just my opinion.
Okay, so this was this this is just a reflection of a little study that's been done in several different studies we've had out there, and this was just the uh, the results that Organis Shield got better than uh, the, the standard test. I think there was Neem and a couple other things. Yeah, against Neem. Sorry, this was the Neem little test, and these are a few problem pests out there in different agricultural sectors. Aphids is if you're a cannon thrower or indoor grower of uh, anything in a greenhouse, you probably are familiar with aphids, white flies, spider mites, thrips, all those fun those fun things. The diamondback moth. That's uh, I think yeah, that came from actually a cabbage a worm that lands on the cabbage and did that. So go to the next one, but this just has given you a, a good idea of how much better it works. Oh yeah, this was a study that was done in Africa. And so you can kind of see the difference of the neem oil. You see the pictures of the neem oil, the sun like burned. I and mean, that's just because the oil, just like a suntan oil under lights, the sun or, you know, under grow lights are going to burn you. So one of the things, the challenges with using products that have oil and not all the products have oil, but some of the products that have oil is if you're spraying as a farmer outside, you have to spray uh, late in the day. So you're a slave to the day at the time you can spray. And if you are a uh, indoor uh, grow farmer under, under grow lights, then you are a slave to that because you have to turn your lights off after you spray. And so so depending on if you're doing a light cycle type uh, grow for cannabis or something like that, where it needs to change the light cycle, you're a slave to that. With Organic Shield, you do not have that problem. You can spray it early day, late day, whatever you want to spray it, safe. Uh, one, safe. More addition, but, sure. one more additional thing, sorry to cut you off on that, was um, just as a good point, I play around a little bit with the Jodam wetting agent, and it's a fairly sure. popular pesticide, fungicide that huh? people are using out there on the organic um, farms. But okay. what I've actually identified when using it is it in so many situations, it causes a similar look to your plants, where yeah. It begins to because I can't remember one of the products in there, but it, it they you add in a very water soluble fertilizer as well oh. into your product that the plants seem to it seems to cause a slight toxicity when applying it. And you know another product that I liked the Jajan Wedding Agent. Even if I like it, the reason why I stopped using it was because I didn't like how my plants looked after using it. And well, if you know, and I and I like how my plants look after using Organic Shield. Well, well, that's why I, I want to bring that up. No, I appreciate it, and I, and I agree with you on that. And a lot of that has to do, like I said earlier, was to me or for us as a company, it's all about outcomes. We're trying to give offer outcomes. You know, I can go through the safety of, of what it's in it and how it works and all that stuff. But as a consumer, if I put myself in consumer shoes, why am I buying a product? I, I want an outcome. And if I'm buying an insecticide, I want an outcome of dead bugs. But if I have the choice, I want an outcome of dead bugs, safe to me, safe to my dog, safe to the environment, not hurt the world, give a little bit back to my plant, and, you know, no harm. Yeah, um, the plants look better. Yeah, well, well, yeah, obviously that's the out, yeah, that's part of the outcome is the plant looking better. But but that that's really it is it's all about outcomes. And that's why I said as we like you were talking about us doing more studies and doing other uh, presentations, as we come up with other things that we can do with our substance, we're going to do that. Our goal with this, I mean, Organic Shield is a great product, and we're going to keep selling that. But we're going to create some other products uh, with the same substance, maybe different concentrations. But the goal is if we can give you an outcome that you're getting now from something else, and we have a better safety profile for you, the environment and everything, your plant or whatever that the, the application is, your animal, then it would be silly not to use this. We're just, I mean, you kind of look at if we're insecticide, but sort of our goal is a chemical removal company. We want well, to, remove, wherever we can remove chemicals and use our substance to replace the outcome, we're always going to have a better safety profile than the chemicals. So that's just, that's sort of our mission statement. That's not out there, but just, un, un, but that's what this is what people are going to see yeah. though when they're using the product is yeah, when, you, yeah. when you use the product your your overall crop yield will increase because of all these other benefits that of how the plant product breaks down well, and so yes. on and so on just as a, as a side as a side note um a friend of mine was he, who was going to the uh, the oklahoma show the, the kushcon or whatever the, the show they had there and he talked to uh, he heard he had a caller talk to a lady from a store and he was talking about organic shield and she said oh is that that co2 spray for the for can of plants and somehow it got the buzz out that you know one of the components it breaks down and you know like with you did the test mark showing, you know, just with that little bitty proof of concept, it went from 400 to almost 800 parts per million CO2 in the little clone dome. So mm -hmm. it was kind of funny how that got out there, you know, that you could be used to the CO2 spray. She didn't even realize it was a bug spray. She thought it was just, she just thought That's it was CO2. CO2 so, supplement. Yeah. So yeah, supplement. So I thought that was funny, but yes, this, I, I, I wish I could say, here's my study mark that proves this is why exactly what happens that you see in the little pictures here. The neem oil obviously stunts things because it clogs the plant. The control group, you really don't have anything and the organic group um, does better. And, you know, those are more studies coming out, but I, I'm fairly certain that it's the CO2 to helps the uptake and helps the xylem and phloem and transport nutrients better because essentially you're giving, you know, as it breaks down, it breaks down into carbohydrates to uh, to water because you mix it with water, to fatty acids that the microbes eat and the CO2 that your plant breathes. So you're giving this plant all these things that it can actually utilize. And then I guess on the top of that is you're taking all the bugs off that were sucking the juice and energy out. So one, that's gone. Now you've given it a new source of energy to take off again. So I kind of look at that as, as why, now this is very unscientific, but that's my opinion. So I don't want anybody to say, well, hold you're a scientist on this, but that's my opinion. Well, if you study John Kemp, actually, he, he validated 
validates also that sugar is an essential part of photosynthesis. It's one uh, sugar is an essential part of the photosynthesis process when mm-hmm. combined with a few other minerals, actually. True, and true, when your true. body breaks down to a, in well, the simple sugars, yes. that's a key component to uh, and, photosynthesis. And actually, you're right. When, when we make it, that you know, we're using specialized sugars and things. And then when it breaks down, I mean, yeah, you could say it's sucrose, but essentially, yeah, it's simple. It's carbohydrates. And, I, and the people that grow with in cannabis, you know, at least I used to buy things for carbohydrate load, which is basically energy load, which, yes, it's type of, of a, a sweetener of sugar. So, yeah, I, I just let, I just share with people it's a carbohydrate because it's a very absorbable sugar by the plant. It's mm-hmm. not something the plant has to break down. It's just like, you know, certain things you eat, your stomach has to break it down before you can uptake it. As this dries, all these components are readily absorbable by the plant. So, I think that's a, a, a good positive. All right. And then, then it just kind of goes to the next page that we're talking about how to improve the harvest. And this was a study that was done in, in Uganda, Africa. It shows there. They also did a chemistry report saying that uh, the surf that actually kills uh, bacteria on surfaces too. So that's a whole nother world. But this shows um, a good document showing the, the, the heads of lettuce that increased using organic shield. But what's interesting about this is you can see the difference in the, the heads of lettuce on, on how much it increased it, which is a, a fairly decent percent. They were excited about this because on the control group, there's nothing sprayed on there. So that's just kind of nature and whatever. And then on the neem oil group, obviously it's a little bit better. And then um, with the organic shield group, you can see it's, it's significantly better uh, yield. And when I was looking at the report they derived this from, I found it kind of interesting because they were spraying it. And then some of the areas I was like, it was almost looked like if they just sprayed it and they didn't have bugs, it was going to make more plant growth regardless. So that, that was why I found it interesting looking at that. But this is just an example. And this was a study that was done in, in Uganda when I was out there. There we go. EPA is Organic Shield, Environmentally Pesticide. So yeah, they say good things about us. I remember when we went through it, they were like, oh, worry about the bees. And like, here's your bee studies um, showing it's safe for bees. You know, basically why they feel this way, or at least my interpretation why they feel this way, is because sucrose esters, um, not our particular molecule, but other molecules of sucrose, or types of molecules of sucrose ester exist in the environment today. For instance, in the production of anything, like, even like your chewing gum, there's sugar esters used in your chewing gum. There's sugar esters used in your cosmetics. There's sugar esters in your food. So basically everybody every day is pretty much consumed consuming some type of sugar ester. An example of a sugar ester maybe in food that just to help people kind of understand it is if you ever had like a chocolate cake and it's so rich or a food that was just so rich on your tongue that just like, wow, it's just overpowering rich. Most likely that was a sugar ester that they use some type of sugar ester molecule to emulsify the fat particulate so that it tastes richer. You taste the more of the chocolate and it tastes the goodness and all that better. And essentially that's what we're doing with our ester molecule, except it's emulsifying the bugs body parts or the bugs soft body parts and letting them dry out. But that kind of gives you an example of every day you are probably consuming how much sugar esters. Not our particular molecule, but we still have the same classification, the same safety. Ours is a little different structure that attacks the bug and nothing else. So uh, Dr. Gary Paterka, who has a, become a, a good friend, and um, he uh, basically was the lead scientist in the USDA. He did the, did the, study, the field trial studies, and you know, he thinks very highly of it, obviously. He has a lot of research. So when, we, when this got approved, it had to go through EPA, but uh, the USDA did the field trials. So it kind of, you know, hand in hand with uh, making sure all the uh, government associations um, believe in it, like in it, you know, and they, they'll, they'll basically push it. So that's pretty much it. So yeah, that's, I guess that's the last slide. That, that's, yeah, that's the last slide, isn't it, Mark? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Great. Guys, if you guys have comments, post it down oh. below. And not a problem. Hold, this uh, level of depth is always important to someone, good, you know, good. and I appreciate that. Thank you very sure. much. And Absolutely. we look forward to bringing you back on the channel soon to explain a few more pesticides and fungicides. Would love to be on it again. And everybody, don't forget to like and subscribe. And that's what we're supposed to say. <laughs> Perfect. Appreciate you. Is it normal that if you took a clone and put it side by side with a plant that was from seed, I think from seed you're going to get a lot more production out of the out of it than you would the clone. And is is that a thing? 